I have kind of an outline in my head, but it's not really a formal presentation. Um, so, like to to introduce myself, my name is Isaac. Um, I'm uh, I live in Finland. I'm a, a game designer. Uh, I've been like for ten years working in games. I'm a game designer at Ubisoft Red Links here in Helsinki. Uh, I also do uh, like art, interactive art uh, on the side. I've uh, I've run um, my own indie studio in the past, um, and I don't really see myself as really boxed in in a specific role. You know, like of of design or abstract design per se. I used to be a, a programmer, for example. But I like to learn new things, and I I like to. Um, Kind of have multiple perspectives on 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 the same thing. Uh, I think like the design, especially or any type of game making, usually comes from a place of curiosity, and especially with games trying to like box people in in a specific specialty or something. I think is usually a mistake. Um, this is why I've worked in uh, in VR, for example, AR. I've worked in mobile games. I've worked in console games. I'm currently working uh, in in a console game myself uh, right now in my day job, but like I've been working on indie stuff like on the side, like ever since I started a career. Really, um, I think games are very interesting. And um, speaking of of interesting games, this might be a good segue and nice opportunity for me to share my screen and a good segue to talk about uh, Disco Elysium, which is a game that I immediately uh, fell in love with um when i played uh i think this was in in back in 2019 actually um i played a lot of it uh during covid as well the lockdown in 2020 it, it was very interesting and got me through like some some you know some of the most dreadful parts of of the pandemic but if you're not familiar with it actually i think we could watch the the trailer that i opened here um it's uh, just, I'm going to play this and, and I'll shut up in a second. Uh, here we go. In the great city at the end of the world, there's a dead body behind the hostile cafeteria and a strike is about to become a war. Precinct 57 sent their finest. Precinct 41 sent... You. Prove them wrong. Or lose your mind. Disco Elysium. Get it now. Um, we're going to do a deep dive on this game. Uh, I'm going to talk like a little bit about it and I'm going to load a save, as I was saying, or to, um, just for you to understand what the game is, if you're not familiar with it. Um, but I'm not going to try to sell you the game. I think like any, anyone can kind of explain you why this game is, is great better than me. Uh, people praise it for its, its interesting, uh, visuals, for example. Uh, for its its like uh, like gut wrenching story or like funny sarcastic writing, um, other people uh, praise it for its themes. Um, it's very verbose, and I'm not presenting like this is just this is not even slides. It's just some screenshots I took, so don't mind me like having this literally uh, on PowerPoint mode like the the editor. It's just uh, maybe we're gonna use Paint.net to make some graphs as well. But yeah, like this is a very like in a nutshell, you're playing um, a detective. Um, you're playing a detective in this kind of fictional uh, setting. It's not really uh, sci-fi. It's not. It's not high fantasy. It's none of that. It's like it's very close to um, to our reality, like to our our to what we would we would think is like a familiar setting. Um, and most of the gameplay is you making choices, uh, choosing what to say, choosing what to listen to. Um, it's also a, a game about um, about alcoholism and, and drug abuse and um, 
it's a game about depression. So like you uh, literally begin the game uh, hungover, um, like on the floor, not knowing where you are. Um, and the game, like on a mechanical level, you can get uh, addicted to more things. It's a game about about not only addiction but a a, a game about redemption. So you kind of have to um, to to make a choice of what kind of person you you want to be if you want to be in a path of self destruction or of redemption. Like the it's very dramatic and the 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 writing is like so superb, etc. Uh, it's also like it's been talked to death, and like um, it's it's really like there's a GDC talk about how um, because this this if you you're playing a cop and a detective, this is more or less a cop simulator, and what kind of references they use, I I, I really recommend this uh, talk. For example, um, it's a game that lets you be anything, so it's it's also um, because of its theme and uh, these themes, and it's it's um, it's very incisive uh, political um, commentary sometimes it's it, it allows you to be the cop you want to be so it's a cop simulator you can be a, a homeless uh, cop you can be a hobo cop for example um, you can be a cop of the apocalypse it lets you be like a doomsday cultist person it, it lets you be a communist it lets you be even um, a fascist it, it lets you be a, a racist even um, you can be any kind of cop you want, and and this is um, that doesn't mean that the game condones that. Uh, it's just a game that lets you be anything and lets you live um, through your failures as well. So like, um, there's a lot of pathos in that. Uh, it's also very um, it's very uh, condemning of like it, it. The game has a, a very left wing kind of lens, uh, but that doesn't mean that you you it's very pandering uh, in that sense. Um, it's that's because its creators are, I think, um, Marxist left-leaning people. That doesn't mean that the game necessarily forces you to to be that. Um, and funny, funny enough, that now the game is also uh, involved in a scandal, uh, like because of like some controversy, and there's a ton of, of YouTube videos on it. Like if you want to uh, do a deep dive uh, on how the game was allegedly, uh, you know, stolen or not stolen, like there's a lot of versions. I'm not here to talk to you about any of that. There's also a very good breakdown of how the UI was made. Uh, and, and I found this video recently about how even the portraits of the characters, like just that in and of, in and of itself, like tells you kind of a story of who the characters are. So for example, this character is supposed to be like very uh, straightforward and, and soulless almost. Uh, the way you perceive that character, like from the lens of the protagonist, like it's very, uh, uh, it's kind of, this kind of a wall where you don't feel a lot of empathy. Whereas, for example, your partner on the left is kind of a, a savior person. It's kind of a, a, a Pinocchio dynamic where um, you um, you see like your partner sort of sort of as a conscience almost, you know, like like the cricket from Pinocchio. So it, it has like um sort of a, a circle around his head whereas this other character on the left uh, has a square is very squarish and has a black square uh, in his head uh, so this is uh, a recovering uh, drug, act, drug addict that that you meet like these face faces literally melting in the in the portrait and it's really interesting it's just um, for example this person is is really um, like has kind of a, an open mind kind of thing it's really, really interesting. There's a lot of things to be said, and I'm not going to talk about any of that, right? What we're going to talk, and I think this is an angle that's very, um, like for the most part, very uh, not talked about, is, is on a systemic level, right? So yeah, the game has great, like amazing visuals, amazing story, amazing lore, amazing writing, amazing a lot of things. Even the music, like which I, I don't have a screenshot for that because I just invite you to 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 literally listen to the music. It's really evocative and and kind of melancholic sometimes. It's really really uh, powerful. It touches you. This is kind of on a very um, senses base, you know, like all of these plays. But I think like on a on a systemic abstract level, um, this game also does a bunch of things that I think are are, are incredible. And that's really what I what I want to talk to you about. Um, 
I, we could maybe before we, we go through like more more of these slides, uh, we could make a, a break here and, and ask how, how many people in the audience are familiar with the game and what kind of experiences um, do you guys have uh, playing the game, something like that. I'd like to, to kind of gauge as well, not only the knowledge, but um, if any of, of what I'm saying so far about like the game being evocative, melancholic, etc., if, if if people really resonate with what I'm saying. And I'm going to maybe stop sharing my screen for a second. Yeah, actually, uh, hi. Uh, I pretty much share your opinion about game being very depressive in a sense, and the way it talks about different sorts of addictions um, made me literally when I quit, when I started to play, because it was mentally very hard to get used to how the game treats the player and what the game says and what words it uses. So I literally had to consciously uh, try to take the game less seriously in order to be able to play it, just because otherwise it was too hard. Yeah, that that's uh, that's not an uncommon experience. I feel like a lot of people like that. It's it's so um, sometimes so sad and bitter, bittersweet that it's really off off putting for some people. Um, or sometimes, like especially, um, there's no like the whole game should be a should have a trigger warning like for its entirety of the content because it it really touches dark stuff. Um, anyone else wants to share maybe a different opinion or or, or corroborate uh, this? Yeah, um, I can say that I had a totally different experience because for me it was something that kind of lifted me up when I was in a really like low or like dark place, I would say. Uh, maybe it's because I'm from Estonia, so <laughs> our climate is this depressive, and uh, I can see like a lot of inspirations actually in this game from our, I would say, yeah, climate basically. Uh, but at the same time, we have amazing sunrises and sunsets, and basically that's the first thing you see when you open the game. And the first thing that I noticed when I was like looking at the menu screen, I was like, wow, like what a sky. So for me, it was more like an uplifting experience and a positive one that kind of helped me out. Um, so that's interesting. So that's another thing I've heard as well. It's very, very, very interesting. Um, but but yeah, like the the, um, the angle of of you being able to to kind of shape whoever you want to be in the game is makes works kind of like a, a Rorschach test in a way, right? Like you can see. Uh, hope you can see despair. You can see anything you want, um, and I, I think this this works really in favor of the story that I want to they they want to tell. And I think the reason why they're doing like it, it's so effective at doing this it's it's because it's a role playing game, right? And so in in role playing games, you role play someone and you make choices in that that mindset. So if if you are at really rock bottom. You can see the kind of the the glass half full or half empty is, is a choice you make, and this is kind of the power of, of, of role playing. It's it's very interesting that that the dark themes uh, are interpreted as as either despair or hope, depending on on who's playing. Um, thanks, by the way, both of you for for sharing uh, that uh, those experiences. I'm going to talk a little bit about role playing games just in a second, just kind of to um, recap as well for because. It's a genre that is very popular, but still, like some people are not familiar with it. Um, so, really, role playing games are, and I'm going to talk about tabletop role playing games because that's really where they were born. Um, like, it's basically a bunch of people sitting around at a table. If you're into live action role playing game, uh, shameless plug, there's going to be a, a live action role playing game summit in like next. Uh, Next month in in Tampere here in Finland, it happens every every year I think. Uh, Nordic uh, uh, live action role playing, but to just Google it. But um, for for regular role playing, you don't have to dress up. You don't have to do a lot of things. You, it's not you don't need a like per se like a, a game master that is like a, kind of a theater person. You just sit around at a table and you talk. And you talk. Sometimes some people talk in the voice 
of their characters. Sometimes like they don't make voices, they, they kind of just make choices. It really depends on, on the kind of, of storyteller, kind of a dungeon master, which is a term that is also used because of, of the ubiquity of, of one of its most uh, famous games, Dungeons & Dragons. Um, they will kind of guide players with rules as to, to choices and, and situations um, that, that they, they see. And, and it's kind of a shared collective hallucination, if you, if you will. It's very interesting because every, everyone's imagination is different. But at that time in, in this table, it's like everyone's tapping into each other's head. Uh, and the, the, the way this is done uh, is through very, um, like, very, very rigid rules. Uh, otherwise, the, that kind of simulation would go into arbitrary nonsense. Um, this is kind of like, for example, the setup of, of Dungeons and, Dra and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons um, is, for the most part, a very elaborate combat simulator. Uh, so it tries to understand what kind of, of character you are from the point of view of, of you know, your body, um, if you have like a strong constitution, strength, uh, but even intelligence and dexterity, which are like mental attributes, those are for the most part how your body reacts to situations as well. Right. And so like uh, it's it's really all about your ability to you know, um, even let's to some extent, your charisma could be interpreted as as your body. Um, obviously, this this then trickles down to, you know, de different abilities and your ability to you know uh, do other stuff that are not strictly speaking combat. But Dungeons and Dragons is is an amazing combat simulator. Like that's really what it was built for. Uh, all of your classes, as a as a as a player, you you your character will have a class. There are also different types of fighters. So um, uh, a, a druid, for example, will have different types of spells than a sorcerer, but they're mostly uh, judged in their ability to cause damage or, you know, cause buffs that help you uh, not lose as much damage. Everything that you throw your dice in in these games are, are usually about, um, are about like killing uh, other people, killing monsters. Uh, not trying to not be killed uh, or escaping a dungeon alive, stuff like that. And and even if, for like the most, I'd say um, like this this is the reference of two other RPGs. This is like Vampire the Masquerade and this is Cthulhu. Um, those are more less combat oriented uh, RPGs, and they're also very famous. But for the most part, combat still plays combat dexterity stamina. Um, and, and yeah, so it, it, playing a tabletop RPG is a lot of dice. Um, you have to make a lot of math, a lot of dice, a lot of numbers. And this is really why uh, video game RPGs uh, were born. Um, so and I think someone has their mic unmuted. I'm not sure who. Um, if, let me just check. Yeah, but yeah let, me, let me know if... if if we still hear uh, some noise, but yeah, just this is kind of a reminder of, of what RPGs are and, and how they came to be and um, and why like video game RPGs, like the digital version of, of RPGs are the way they are. So um, you have a lot of genres. I'm not going to do a deep dive on this, but you have uh, the Western RPG, the Eastern RPG, or sometimes they were called computer RPGs in the beginning and Japanese JRPGs in the beginning. Now, like you have as well the action RPG and they're, they're different attempts at, at trying to emulate that experience that you cannot really have in like playing a, a game with, with your, like in, in a computer. Um, you cannot have the same experience as being in like with your friends around the table. So like the Western RPGs are, are very stat based, but for the most part, they're, they're very much about reading a ton of text um they're very verbose they have a ton of text and and they're usually divided into more uh, okay now this is the combat part now this is the dialogue part um eastern rpgs kind of took that and flip it flipped it around its head i'm not gonna talk too much about it uh action rpgs uh as well it's just a mention here but 
they tried to just do the combat part, really. So because you can't really emulate this um, talking with your friends at, around the table, you, there's limitations around that. Like an, it's not the same thing playing solo in front of your computer. Action RPGs like Diablo, for example, they were like, these games are all about stats and killing monsters. So let's do that very well and, and, and forget about the story. Obviously, Diablo has a story, but like it's not it's not the same thing. I'd say it's not as story focused in terms of, of of what it's trying to achieve. And then you have like very very like it branches into these so many different things. You have the the MMO, the MMORPG, right? Like a uh, World of Warcraft. You have the now recent Souls like uh, kind of trend. You have the the roguelike. You have a ton of stuff. Um, and now, as well, everything is an RPG at the moment, right? Like, uh, even Call of Duty or, you know, a game like Horizon Forbidden West or, like, they all have um, the same kind of mechanics as RPGs. As you have talent trees, you have stats, you have XP, you level up. Um, because these are, are mechanics that are very interesting. So we could be here talking for hours about RPGs. This is the most amount of talking about RPGs that I'm like in in the abstract that I'm going to talk. I'm just going to do a, a quick deep dive into two case studies uh, to give you the general tropes and trends of RPGs. But but yeah, we're not gonna. This is not a a lecture about RPGs. It's just for you to when I'm going to talk about this coalition for you to compare um, what this coalition does in relation to the genre of RPGs as well. Um, and so, like two case studies, uh, Baldur's Gate three, which came out last week, um, last week, last year, and Pillars of Eternity, which is another RPG um, that that was when it came out was very famous. Let's start with Pillars of Eternity. So, um, in a nutshell, this is kind of the tropes that I was um, that I was mentioning. You build a character. Right, and you can see here the the stats like that I just because Pillars of Eternity is built on in the Dungeons and Dragons uh, framework. You you have uh, dexterity, intelligence. Actually, no, I think it's their own. Uh, it, it might not be Dungeons and Dragons. It's their own thing, but still very similar, right? Um, actually, the, it's uh, uh, I think it might be might instead of strength. It's their own their own version, but yeah, you build your character, you you choose your background, you choose you choose your class, your race, etc. Um, you have an inventory where you can store items. It's uh, like you 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 share stuff across uh, different people as well, but like you can equip uh, stuff like your weapon, uh, ring, etc. You have a quest log. Uh, this quest log like we will give you an idea of what you what you're doing. Will guide you through the story. I uh, will give you objectives. Um, all of these stats and all of the the inventory and etc. They are for the combat sections. So like you you have like it's very very f combat focused. You could be hours fighting a boss. It's like it, a lot of it is just this pause on pause game where you you click on enemies. You your wizard throws you know a fireball. Your fighter kills like a goblin with its sword. Um, and then the whole thing pauses and you start talking. So it's literally this. It's very, it's very interesting as a trope. A, a trope. Um, this kind of Western tradition of RPGs is like combat, 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 talk, 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 combat, combat, combat. Um, and yeah, like it's uh, you level up. You have these stats. Uh, um, and and the the funny thing is these stats are sometimes the the because you don't have a game master, and because you could technically, you know, if you're talking with someone, you could threaten them with a sword, you know, like in a, if you're talking with your game master, um, you could try to negotiate that. Um, because you don't have a game master in video games, what you do is this, right? Like you, you still have options in the dialogue to use um, your, your skills. So, for example, here you use your lore knowledge to make a comment because you've unlocked this because you have enough stats. If you were playing a different character that didn't have lore and maybe had some some other type of knowledge, maybe you could do something else. If if you were charismatic enough, maybe you could persuade them something something like that. Same thing with Baldur's Gate, right? You again, uh, you'll see this is very familiar. 
you build your character. Uh, these these are the abilities of Dungeons and Dragons. I think Baldur's Gate is like one hundred percent Dungeons and Dragons. Um, you have an infantry. Um, you murder a bunch of people. Like it's still like this kind of uh, dialogue, killing dialogue, killing combat dialogue kind of thing. You have a quest log. Same thing. Um, you this is the dialogue section. So I think Baldur's Gate because it's more recent. It's it's a bit more. Um, I think like more cinematic in its presentation so it's it's not as boxed and, and there's not, not not as much ui it's like the camera flows and the characters are very like detailed and stuff uh but yeah like you level up still you have a, a, a um, ability points to to attribute every time you gain xp and um you still have checks for stuff that is not strictly speaking combat so for example in this case the character um like this checking like his his knowledge of of religion to to may, maybe make a comment um so this is not just the abilities on the abilities are not just to deal damage and defend damage and, and you know magic and etc sometimes they're for dialogue as well um there's even more tropes uh and and i swear i'm gonna uh, stop talking about all of this but um the uh, RPGs usually are high fantasy or sci-fi, so these are like the two most famous um, RPGs of Bethesda, which is a, a company that solely makes RPGs. You have the elves and dwarves version of that, and you have the space suits, you know, um, lasers, etc. Um, you usually have companions. Uh, so that you unlock, you have a party of people and uh, talking with others, like you, like your roster of people gets bigger and bigger. Um, you, your companions usually banter as well. Like uh, so, this is a, another trope of of uh, of RPGs in video games. Uh, as you can see, like uh, it's kind of pixelated, but you're walking the level, and depending on the companions you you choose to accompany you, they will have different. Um, it will have different interactions. You're usually the chosen one as well. It's usually the end of the world, and you are usually an amnesiac silent protagonist sometimes, but usually amnesiac. You wake up in the middle of nowhere, uh, you don't know who you are. And all of these tropes are really, if you think about it, they, they are a way of trying to make sense of this kind of dynamic, right? Because you cannot make your character in a video game. You can never truly make your character. Like, you, you can invent your background when you're playing with friends. Um, but the only way for you to take a character that is that is profound and has a lot of detail and really make it your own is if the character is a blank slate and has no memory. Same thing, for example, uh, with um, the end of the world and the chosen one. It's like when you're playing with other people, you are obviously not the protagonist, but it feels very relevant and feels very important. Well, this is a way to cope with that as well. If you're playing by yourself and you're playing alone, it's kind of sad if you have no companions and no other players. So this kind of simulates as well this, this shared experience. Uh, even more tropes, uh, you have the morality, how you deal with morality. So this is Fallout. In Fallout, you can nuke an entire place and you lose karma. Uh, it's like a karma system. Um, in uh, Mass Effect, you have like this uh, kind of also light dark kind of thing where it's instead of being light dark, it's uh, Paragon Renegade, and, and literally your face will melt if you will become too evil. But then you have games like The Witcher that treats morality as this kind of gray thing, uh, where, like, uh, for example, here uh, you are technically working with an elf terrorist. Uh, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? The terrorist is trying to uh, uh, prevent genocide. So technically, what kind of morality is that? Um, do you also have the verbose versus whale choice? So uh, sometimes, as I like, this is Baldur's Gate again. You have a lot of text, but some people have solved this by having kind of a, a very simple wheel because reading a lot of text is also not doesn't really flow that much and doesn't make it feel like you you are talking with other people like this feels more like a contract that you're signing and this this feels way more you know casual to like this you talk as you 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 would talk with like a re really real human being and then you have the um, as i was saying like a real full-fledged character versus a generic vessel for the player um 
so for example in skyrim you can uh, choose the color of your eyes your race etc but it's that that character will have your name doesn't really have a background it's whatever you want you can choose its physical attributes but it's that character is you right it's you with another skin whereas uh, uh like for example in in dragon age um everyone calls you hawk um depending even depending on so this is a gender neutral name um you you this would be impossible in skyrim because you write your own name but here like yeah. everything is a bit more railroad railroaded and and you feel like you you are more real and you have more real attributes and and so because the the, the your background is a bit less negotiable you feel also that your character is more fleshed out uh, same thing with the witcher right like Geralt of Rivia is a very like detailed character with with a lot of traits and has um not only a specific training specific background but like a roster of friends that like that's not your choice it's like a specific um sp a specific thing that is that has been imposed on you so um i realized we might have spoken too much about rpgs in general and and time is will be running out soon but uh what about this realism what kind of choices does this realism make so um first and foremost yes it's verbose but it has this ui here on the left that if you um Remember when I said that you could watch a video uh, here about like how the UI was made? Um, just go and, and, and watch this because this is a very good breakdown of, of the kind of UX um, that this Quilism did to, to, to make the game feel verbose but also not boring and not, not too, uh, too literate. You have um, uh, literally a, a thing that was inspired by a Facebook feed or a tweet, Twitter feed, and it gets filled up. It just goes up and up and up, and you can always go back and see, like, kind of like a timeline. Um, it just fills up more text, but it's never too much text, and it's never like at the center uh, or anything like that. Another thing is, like, for the most part, it's exactly the same as any other. Um, video game RPG, like you have um, a map, you have a journal, like that's your quest log. You have inventory as well. Um, you have also, you can build your own character. You have stats and etc. cetera. Um, you also have a character with amnesia. Uh, this is like very, very interesting. Like the, the name Disco Elysium is a, is a play on Disco Inferno. So Elysium being the opposite of inform inferno like uh inferno is is hell elysium is heaven not really but kind of this is um is your like a kind of a, a commentary on on a washed up person that is like very like in, in the wrong time like too old kind of uh you know like that feeling of yeah in the 80s everything was super like great and etc and now, like in the two thousands, you you you're a recovering addict. That's that's kind of the vibe they're going for, and so the amnesia thing is actually works really well uh, for this game because you are an alcoholic, um, among other things that like is so brain damaged of all of the excesses that you have that you literally lose your memory. So this this they take this trope and flip flip in on its head to make a commentary and also to kind of make an interesting um setup as well like when you wake up for example your portrait is just a blur you have no idea who you are and then when you when you finally look in in the mirror you see your face and you're terrified um this is also like very cringy like the game is very much leans you to it, it pushes you to to make terrible, uh, awkward decisions all the time, and this this is, for example, you singing at, in a karaoke, um, probably like hungover. Um, you have no idea who you are, and you are in the middle of this like detective investigation. Uh, I don't want to spoil you the story, etc. But like it, it's it's a very interesting way to to spin the whole character and amnesia thing. And um, the game has no companions. Uh, it's an interesting choice as well. So your only companion is um, this character here, and it gives this this vibe of you know like uh, two partners solving a mystery. So you you are trying to solve a a, a case. You are both detectives, 
And as, as I said, it, it, it also has this dynamic of, the, of Pinocchio and the cricket. And this is really the, the part I wanted to, to, to get to. Um, the game has no combat. So if you remember when I was saying um, that most of RPGs are uh, this thing where you murder a bunch of people and then uh, it's like talking time, like it's literally going back and forth between murder, talking, murder, talking. This is an inheritance of these, um, these tabletop RPGs, right? Like these games were built around the idea of, of being a, a, a combat simulator. So it's really impossible for you to, to escape that. If you're Baldur's Gate and you built on, on Dungeons & Dragons, even if you have the best dialogue ever, your game is mostly focused on, on combat. It's, it, like, that's really where all the mechanics lead to. Um, and this coalition doesn't have combat at all. In this coalition, you go around and you investigate things and you talk with people. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's literally what the game is. And I'm, I'm going to load a save just to show you. Um, actually, two saves. So uh, the first one um, will be, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in... Um, let's see. I, have, I, I, I made these two screenshots so I, I remember. Um, This takes, I should have should have booted the game earlier, actually. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to load. Um, I also realized I haven't shown you the game yet, but yeah. So this is, in a nutshell, the game. Uh, here we are on the top of a roof, and we have this character we can talk to, for example. Hello, officer. What and you... Here again? You're interrogating a potential sure. witness. You make questions, etc. No, you I can could... also um, like leave the area. Um, we're gonna go down. So we are at the top of this this hotel. And as I was saying, you have uh, your journal here. Right, then you have your inventory, as as I was saying. Um, again, as I as I said as well, is has a very distinct art style. I'm just gonna um, talk with this character, for example. Can I help you? Drop so you right are. Um, and why are you wasting? How strange! I certainly didn't put them there. The you're making choices. Oh, thank you anyway. I think talking with people your forte, and so like you are this character here this is your partner sometimes your partner will intervene um let me load another um save as well to show you how this works so this is another another uh place um um hour another time frame and it's not just that you you speak with characters uh, in this uh, in the the right side uh, thing. You also have insights, right? Like you uh, will have thoughts. Um, you also, like for example, here, like this literally feels like a detective uh, thing, right? Like you you click on things and and you make observations. Um, so this, I'm showing you how the game works on a mechanical level. And the question is then, why is this an RPG and not a point and click? So I'm not going to do a huge deep dive on, on point and clicks, but in a nutshell, that's what the genre is. Like the, this is Monkey Island, the very first Monkey Island game. This is the latest Monkey Island game. They're, they're very famous point and click games. In these games, you also sort of click around and and sees things and solve puzzles and and you also talk with characters so why is this a, a point and click and um, and how really how how does this coalition get to dodge combat right because so many of the of the games like these games are are all about um are all about like literally all of them are about combat all of them 
uh, combat is literally 90% of the experience. Um, it's interesting, right? Like, like literally, for example, like dexterity, etc. Like, if you're a wizard, your attack is intelligent, plus whatever, plus etc. If you are a fighter, like if you use a sword, it's strength. If it's like, if you're an archer, it's dexterity. Literally, all of these stats are about that. Um, so, how did they get away with this? I I've been dodging uh, talking about this, uh, and and now like it's basically these characters here. Um, so these characters are really what I wanted to talk about. Uh, I I'm I guess I'm a bit uh, I'm taking a bit too long to get here, but I, I think it's still um, it's still good to to take time and and do this deep dive. Uh, maybe we're gonna have to to take a little bit extra time in the end. I'm not sure, but um, these characters here, unlike the characters I was I was showing. Like in the beginning, unlike unlike the characters I I just talked to uh, just a few moments ago, these characters are have weird portraits. Like this one, for example, doesn't have a face. Uh, this one literally is a uh, like their their eyes are connected to what seems to be like a tentacles or something. Um, so these characters here, they're called one is called volition, another is called suggestion, another is called authority. And they're color coded, and and this character here, for example, is called uh, drama, and this one is called encyclopedia, uh, this one is called uh, perception, and this one is called reaction speed. All of these characters are skills in the game. So when you um, when you play the game, actually, let's say you're talking with someone, all of a sudden, a uh, physical instrument, which is a character here physical instrument could just show up and talk with you. So one of the great things about you uh, being completely insane and slowly having a mental breakdown, this is a good device to, to make you amnesiac, but it's also a good device, as a plot device, a, a thematic device, to have literally voices in your head talking with you. And so much so that, like, uh, they sometimes, like, s different voices will comment on the same thing. So as you, as you level up these skills, literally your, your, your voices will, depending on which, which voices you want to invest in, you want to level up, like, they will have different things to say about the investigation. Um, like, for example, here, physical instrument said something, rhetoric said something, pain threshold said something. Sometimes uh, they will uh, literally uh, argue with one another. Uh, so, for example, you let's say you're you're um, you're saying, "Wait, am I? Was I a, a weightlifter in the past?" Because you're trying to figure out who you are. And this character that is very cryptic, very symbolic, says, "No, it's not that. You you smell. Um, it's the the slate, the stale smell of rubber, the squeaky sound of of sneakers, your bruised knee against the mat." So it's very poetic, and this one this says like logic says it's just a memory. So completely, uh, this one is very poetic. And this one is just to to the facts, very very straightforward. Um, another example here uh, is, sorry, not not an example. You remember when I said that that uh, RPGs have companions, and I said this Quilizum doesn't have companions. Well, um, they instead of having like three four people behind you bantering. You have this. Uh, you have this because your mind is literally shattered into all of these dimensions. Um, you can literally level up every single one of these voices, and um, instead of having you know the traditional dexterity, stamina, um, what was the other thing, constitution, etc., you have um, physique, but physique in the in the sense of 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 like uh, your mind, how how your mind ties to the physics. You have intellect, psyche, and motorics, which are your and high coordination, reaction speed, stuff like that, perception. But all of those are, for the most part, mental skills, cognitive skills. It's very very interesting. Uh, I'm going to show you again um, one last uh, save here. So. Again, I can I can sense a few things. 
And you can see that the, the green ones are uh, like regular perception stuff, but some of them are colored depending on, on your skills. And I'm going to talk uh, with this person here. You see a Samaran street vendor surrounded by a motley assemblage of goods. When he realizes you're looking at him, his face breaks into a wide, welcoming grin. The name Sileng is embroidered over his breast pocket. So in this build, I have a high perception, but perception is this character in my head. Happy shopping, officer! Everything's cool here. Everything's cool. The goods are cool. The customers are cool. The place is cool. And one more thing, office, you're very cool. What? You like pre- Don't be distracted by the flattery and funny man act. Questions. And I can also do the same as I was saying with Baldur's Gate or with um, A Pillars of Eternity. I can do a check with rhetoric, rhetoric being one of these voices in my head. Start with a little compliment, then work your way up from there. This is about business, remember. Oh, okay. An investment? What kind of investment? I hear you, officer. Sounds like a fair deal all around. I'm, I'm now I'm I'm threatening this person for for this person to give me money. This is what like like my voices are allowing Correction. me to do. And as you can see here, like my character, like my companion, is literally the Pinocchio cricket is judging me for what I did. So this is a system it's just that like bus or seagull, a kid watching out of a window describing things going by. He doesn't like it too much, but what do you do? That's that's empathy speaking in your in your head. So. Um, I think I think this is um I'm gonna kill the game for a second so because so so I don't have to hear the music. This is in a nutshell how the game works. And uh, you you one could praise like the writing, etc. But I, I honestly think um the game cannot work without this this setup. This is the mechanical setup that makes the game work. And it's very well embroidered, uh like and enmeshed with the themes. Um, as you level up and as you go through your journey, the, vo the voices become more and more pronounced in your head. Uh, depending on the build you made, you will hear also more of like intellect voices or psyche voices or and so on. Then I had prepared this small um, comparison here that I can maybe dodge for a second. Uh, but I was I was thinking of comparing it. I, I think we don't have enough time. To, to Pentiment, which is a game made by Obsidian, who made a ton of RPGs. And it's very interesting because uh, in really going through it, like in a breeze, I, I had a, a save game prepared, but forget about this. Uh, it's a game as well with a unique art style. Uh, it's a game like, for example, like uh, characters from other ethnicities are drawn in a different way. Uh, old characters are, because this is kind of a book, like a medieval book, like old characters are, are, are a bit defaced and, and, and uh, rot. Then, uh, depending on the social class, uh, the characters have different fonts. So you have scenes like this, where like, uh, this is like more of a, um, uh, um, sorry, a literate person. And this is more of a like illiterate person. Uh, you have a journal, you have a character creator everything right and so um exactly the same systems why is pentiment a point and click because that's how the game is being sold it's literally made by an rpg maker and it's literally like the exact same things as this realism through and through why is it one of them is is being like is people refer to it as a point and click and and this as an rpg it's literally because of this i cannot really i cannot understate how uh, important this is. This realism is the first game, the first RPG that managed to successfully remove the combat simulator trope from the genre and make literally a, a complicated maze of, of skills and checks and balances and etc. literally deconstruct the whole genre. Um, and and it's uh, uh, literally the same thing. As, as you go through your quest, you would unlock more companions, you unlock more voices. Uh, you dodge completely combat, 
um and and you have really poignant uh discussions in your head like sometimes it's um you know someone warning you about like a physical thing for example sometimes it's like uh an empathetic look at someone as you just saw in the play playthrough that i was i was doing uh sometimes it's for you to solve a, a, a the, the mystery right like for you to to solve um you know um to help you in your investigation so visual calculus here is like a like kind of a csi vision um but sometimes it's just for pure po poetry um for example here behind the gates heaps of supply crates red and blue metal chip uh, shipping containers slick with rain uh the greater revachal industrial harbor is artif an artificial mountain range immense wealth resides within this is just literally a storyteller um it it has no mechanical purpose it's just there to give you more content um again one of the th voices in your head is your need to uh your need for addiction you need for for dopamine it's called electrochemistry so for example you you see uh you do an autopsy and you see like that um the a kilo of a quarter of a kilo of coke was jammed into someone's uh, nasal cavity logic says that's anatomically impossible and electrochemistry goes wrong again or the well where there's a will there's a way it's always pushing you to to take drugs uh, and sometimes you literally have arguments in your head you know these guys who me yes you uh he's talking about you you boring stiff you too like and they literally the voices are are arguing um it's i'm yeah i'm we're out of time but i read a few more notes here and there doesn't matter this is very much a game about like anarchy um the themes are like it's left left leaning towards the more libertarian anarchic uh, thoughts um it's very it's not anti-police but it it can be it depends on how you play it um it's very interesting but all of these themes and thoughts are echoed in its very brilliant in my opinion uh, mechanics um and final note like revachol is named after a famous anarchist so i'm not making this stuff up um it's it's very very evocative but again the the the, the matrix of this is is these very well written very completely like crazy abstract characters that that live in your head um and that's it uh so uh, i will shut up for a second and sorry for all of this content i had planned um this to be a bit shorter i think we can have 10 minutes of maybe questions and answers um or five if if i'm sorry like for running over time um but that was basically what i wanted to talk about it's just um the mechanical brilliance of disco Elysium really makes its themes stick and and actually works towards these themes uh but not only that i think it's extremely important for the the whole rpg genre just because of that deconstruction um that's it i don't know if anyone has any questions or comments much uh at least for my side from my side yeah we we could go a little bit over time if people have questions feel free to i guess open your voice or or write if you don't wanna want to be heard thank you that was interesting let's see let me see um maybe i can ask something yeah. go ahead um well, I have heard that after Disco Elysium, there were like a bunch of people who were like really inspired by the system, mechanical system that you could speak with your emotions and people started to um, kind of copy pasting that, uh, but they could not pull it off. So I was thinking maybe you can, as a designer, speak about why they were successful. So they implemented this new system and it could have, you know, being boring or strange or weird, but for some reason people liked it. So as a professional, do you know why? Or maybe you have some ideas? Well, uh, one of the, the reasons why I wanted to talk about this game is because I'm not a narrative designer and I'm not a writer in general. I, I, I write stuff, but I, I wouldn't. I'm not a writer by profession. And so I think like um, the comments I wanted to, to do is that I think like a lot of narrative people and, and like branching story, nonlinear 
uh, narrative folk like like to talk about the game with very very few systems designer people um i think this is also this advantage for me to to answer your question because i think that what makes it work is it's great writing and it's not just um you you can offer uh, a lot of choices but if ultimately if your if your story sucks or if you're not as a, as talented as the writers of this game are which they're they're very very talented they were writing novels way before they started like, working in games um unless you have all of that it's really hard for you to make an engaging story and i think that's what makes it click when you are you have a weak story you might get away with with just having combat but then again you need to have to be really good at making combat right like a lot of of, of really cool rpgs with cool stories just have very bad combat and that again the experience suffers because of that so whatever your experience <laughs> you're trying to build is if you um like just make make all of the important parts uh shine and I can say, like, side note, as a, as an indie developer, like, I used to be an indie developer, and, and technically I still am uh, in off hours. Um, like, sometimes to, to save costs, we don't hire the right people to do stuff. Like, um, right, like, you'll do marketing, you'll do production, you'll do this, and, and sometimes you'll say, okay, I'm going to write the story, and I'm going to program, and I'm going to do the art. And, and yeah, that means that, that your game is going to, is going to be very mediocre because you cannot possibly excel as, at all of these things. So let's say that if your game is is really story driven and your mechanics make the story shine, just hire someone who writes a good story. Uh, that would be my advice. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I I think it does. Yeah, yeah, more or less. But then it's then yeah, basically. Uh... Uh, that was another like that kind of made me think then like why like I have seen so many games that have like really poor writing and in your answer you basically answered why <laughs> that if people are trying to save costs and don't hire proper people for that that's basically the result and it's a pity because well I hope at least after Baldur's Gate and uh, Disco Elysium's success that there would be more narrative driven games. I hope that people will, you know, uh, hire better people for that, or at least hire them at all. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And and uh, also, I think my my answer might be a little bit limited as well. Uh, it's not just like have a good story. Obviously, that that goes without saying. Maybe as well. Uh, if you want to do Disquilism and emulate that thing, you probably should like the the talks i i kind of uh put in the beginning like the gdc one that i mentioned about like uh meaningful choices is really interesting like their approach was very different uh from from what you traditionally see in non-linear uh storytelling they 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 have very interesting design uh flows and and design frameworks to to build story in that game so maybe the mechanics should be built around that as well. Um, if you're just trying to copy paste, maybe maybe it doesn't translate that well. But I would definitely recommend anyone interested to check those talks because the creators are the best people themselves to 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 help you reverse engineering um, what they did. I think we have time for one more, um, or maybe not. Uh, yeah, actually, I do have a question. Um, do you have an idea about balancing? Because there are a lot of the skills in game, uh, none of them like um, influence how you play. Some of them just basically talk, but some of them do influence the gameplay quite a bit. So, uh, do you have any idea um, what was the balancing strategy for it? Because for me, it seems like it's pretty hard. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I've wondered that myself many times, and and I've made several playthroughs to kind of see, uh, try to to reverse engineering. Like I think it's just brilliant because whatever fourth hand you're trying to do, you're always gonna have some exceptions. But I think that if I'm not mistaken, 
um, some of the um, like so you have uh, columns and rows, right? Like the the rows are uh, your your skills, and then let's say your voices, your abilities are like the 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 columns and the rows uh, combined. Uh, but if you let's say uh, maybe with the visual aid, it's it's better. Uh, one second. What I was saying, like, is um, I think I might be mistaken, but I think like the the way this works is for every uh, row, there's one voice that has a specific uh, role to play, and uh, they're interchangeable. Not really, but like for example, shivers gives you some insight about like the world and what you see around you and i think for example that logic does the same thing or encyclopedia the, the uh, obviously i'm simplifying but i'm not sure like inland empire gives you a lot of insights and if you have like a high psyche whenever there's an insight to be to be given it's going to be this voice here that's going to talk if you have a high physique it's going to be shivers and I'm not sure, I think, like, I'm obviously simplifying, but depending, so, like, for example, to solve, like, f formally solve the case and, like, do detective work, visual calculus helps a lot. I think maybe uh, this this cop, esprit de corps, means, like, uh, is, like, your, your cop persona in your head. Maybe they will both contribute to the same thing. So probably what, um, have a matrix of, um, uh, of like needs for every character and they would fill in maybe like they're not interchangeable because I think that's a, the wrong way to, to say it. But I, I think there's different needs depending on the context and they assign those needs to different voices so that whatever build you, you do, you never stuck. Um, and you have kind of always some insight into what's going on, but I could be wrong. I've not designed the game. You probably should ask them <laughs> basically. Okay, thank and, you. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of time. Um, maybe. Right? Yeah. Maybe. Well, if there's like one immediate question, maybe we can take that. Still, yeah, the, but... there's one in the chat. There's one in the chat saying if you have any criticism of this coalition. Um. Yeah, I do have several, <laughs> but uh, uh, I I don't. Uh, one thing I think, for example, if 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 you were to deconstruct the RPG genre, I do feel the inventory is kind of a necessary there. Like um, it feels very shoehorn, for example. Um, but that's that's a nitpick, really, because I don't think the game suffers because of it. And I, I think that we can we can close with this one.